Good evening. My name is Cornell Morton, and I serve as president of the Diversity Coalition, San Luis Obispo County. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and to welcome you to this dialogue. And as we begin, I just want to share a couple of things with you related to the Diversity Coalition. So we are um, a nonprofit organization. Uh, we were formed in March of 2011. Uh, it was unfortunately um, as a result of a hate crime in Aurora Grande in March of 2011, when a cross burning occurred in the yard of a black family in Aurora Grande. A number of individuals from our community came together to support the family, uh, decided after some time to continue to work on social justice issues in San Luis Obispo County. And the short of that story is that that created uh, enough energy and uh, dedication, if you will, uh, to change in our county, which then formed the Diversity Coalition. As a nonprofit, uh, we're interested in collaboration with other organizations in the name of equity, uh, social justice, and promoting diversity. We work closely with local schools, especially uh, in the interest of reaching young people. And we've also done quite a bit of work with local schools uh, in the name of teacher uh, development and professional development, especially. So the Diversity Coalition was created to provide programs and resources. And in that way, uh, tonight is one more example of that effort. Uh, we have a series that we titled Fostering Understanding uh, in our community. Fostering understanding includes uh, making certain uh, we all have an opportunity to learn more about the individuals, the organizations that are a part of our community. We are uh, interested in your continued support and we would invite you to continue to watch out for other programs that are upcoming. Tonight, um, we are very pleased to have Alan Salazar with us. Uh, I'm going to introduce Alan and I'm going to uh, ask him to share uh, with us and then you'll have an opportunity to raise questions and uh, to comment on uh, his presentation. Alan Salazar, a Native American consultant, monitor, traditional storyteller, spiritual advisor, and a traditional paddler of Shumash canoes. He's also been a preschool teacher and a juvenile institution officer. Alan is also a journeyman plasterer. And since, a young man, since being a young man, he's been uh, around construction, for example, most of his life. Alan's family has been traced back to Shumash and Tatavarian uh, village of Tafu, now known as Simi Valley, and the Tatavian village of Piang near what is today modern day Magic Mountain. His ancestors were brought, brought into the San Fernando mission starting in 1803, and he has been actively involved in protecting ancestral sites and tribal territories, which include the Malibu area. He's also uh, involved in uh, several Native American groups and the organizations and work that is underway. And for example, he is a founding member of the Kern County Native American Heritage Preservation Council and the Shumash Maritime Association. He's a member of the California Indian Advisory Council for the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Allen has been a community advisor with the Ventura County Indian Education Consortium for over 18 years. And he's currently a member of the Environmental Review Board for the city of Malibu. As a member of the Shumash Maritime Association, Allen helped build the first working traditional Shumash plank canoe in modern times and paddled in this plank canoe for over 17 years. He's been involved with protecting Native American cultural sites for more than 20 years and has been a consultant and monitor on sites in Ventura, 
in Los Angeles, in Santa Barbara, in San Luis Obispo and Kern counties. Allen explains that today, it's not easy being a proud California Native American. Misinformation about the tribe is still out there. There are many obstacles to overcome, but as Allen says, he was raised to be a proud, to be proud of his Native American heritage. He takes great pride in being a positive role model and a respected elder. He's also someone who has a very positive relationship with many of the native leaders and native people in California. And he takes his responsibilities as an elder very seriously. I'm sure you might want to add other uh, aspects of your background and your experiences, Alan. Uh, this is just a brief introduction, but please feel free to share more about yourself, about your work and about the important things you're doing throughout California. And so on behalf of the Diversity Coalition, I want to thank you for being with us. And I'd like to uh, have you go forward now with your comments. Thanks again for being with us. Uh, thank you, Cornell. Uh, Amanat Nethawan Alan Salazar, Setha uh, Lucasin. Hello, I am Alan Salazar. I am from the village of Setha what we now call San Fernando, California. I want to start my talk tonight uh, uh, talking about my Chumash and Tataviam family. I get my Chumash and Tataviam ancestry from my father's side of the family. And uh, appropriately today, uh, being Veterans Day, uh, the first family picture I, I will start with is my father when he was a young man. So my father was in the Marines and fought in World War II in Saipan and Okinawa. Uh, it's my father's side that I get my uh, Chumash and Taviyam ancestry. This is my father later on in life. Uh, he lived uh, till age 78 and, and worked in construction uh, up until uh, the last few months of his life. Uh, survived uh, the Great Depression and uh, World War II. Uh, this beautiful woman right here is my grandmother, uh, uh, Vera Ortega Salazar. This picture was taken in 1915 uh, at her uh, christening. Uh, my grandmother was a good Catholic and went to mass uh, uh, twice a week uh, and lived well into her 80s. This gentleman right here is my great grandfather, Antonio Maria Ortega. My great-grandfather, Antonio Maria Ortega, was born in 1855. He was born at a time when it was extremely dangerous to be a California native, a time when someone could have killed my great-grandfather and they wouldn't have been sent to jail or to prison. Uh, they would have been actually paid. Uh, the bounty system started in, in 1849 and lasted until 1873. Uh, so when my great-grandfather was born well until he was a young man uh, uh, in his late teens, uh, someone could have killed him and they would have been paid a bounty of five, 10, $20. Uh, and the, the difference was if you just killed a, a California native in the 1850s, 60s and early 70s, if you just brought in their scalp, you were given a smaller bounty or reward of five to ten dollars if you killed a California native and chopped off their head, you were paid a larger bounty, 20, 25, 30 dollars. Uh, several hundred thousand dollars were paid out uh, in bounties. Uh, so California native peoples, uh, native people that trace their ancestry to the California tribes, uh, like my family, uh, survived one of the one of the worst genocides in US history. Many people don't know that there were more Indian massacres in California than any other state. There were over 300 recorded massacres uh, in California. Uh, the first personal story I wanna share with you, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the Chumash, a little bit about the Tatabiam, and then I'll finish up talking about uh, something I'm extremely proud of, and that's my involvement with our Chumash uh, Kamol, uh, our Chumash Ocean Canoes. Uh, there's a book 
that was written about four or five years ago. Uh, it's called American Genocide. And American Genocide is about that period I, I just mentioned from 1849 to 1873 and the bounty system and the genocide of California tribal people. It's written by Dr. Benjamin Madley. Uh, uh, it's a very well done book. Uh, uh, he researched uh, th that history in that time period very thoroughly and, and has, uh, can, can back up all his facts and all the numbers, which uh, are extremely uh, gruesome. It's a book that there was times I could read 40 or 50 pages and, and couldn't wait to get to the next chapter. And then there were nights that I would read five or six pages and have to put the book down. Uh, so it, it, it's a difficult read, but it, it's a true story. And the reason I bring it up is that for about 20 years or so, well, actually over 20 years, I, I've been helping organize a, a summer solstice uh, ceremony at Mount Pinos. Mount Pinos is by Fraser Park. Uh, it's uh, the highest mountain in Chumash territory, 8,800 feet. It's where the Chumash people for tens of thousands of years have gone to do ceremony. And uh, I started helping organize a summer solstice ceremony up there and, and started in 1996. And in the early 2000s, I was up where we hold our little ceremony, which is a walk-in campground. And uh, there's a large parking lot. Uh, it's almost at the top of the mountain. And uh, I was there, there a couple days earlier, getting the campground cleaned up and picking up trash and, and raking and setting up our circle for our ceremony. And as I was walking back to my car, a gentleman walks up to me and he asked me a question that I've been asked thousands of times. Are you an Indian? I go, uh, yes. He goes, what tribe? I said, I'm Chumash and Tatavia. And he looks me dead in the eye and says, I heard that the Chumash were cannibals. I go, no, we, we weren't cannibals. He goes, no, you were. I says, no, I, I, uh, I know several anthropologists and have worked with a lot of archeologists and, and historians. Uh, there's no mention of Chumash being cannibals. He goes, no, the, the Shumash uh, were cannibals. And I realized no matter what I said, I couldn't change his mind. So at that point, I reached onto the back of his arm and squeezed it and went, mmm, tasty. And that angered him and he, he stormed off, which was the goal I wanted to accomplish. And then I read American Genocide. And in American Genocide, Dr. Madley talks about the early settlers that came out for the gold rush, over 100,000 people in one year. And they were told when they were leaving the East Coast to come out into the West Coast that all the Indians in California were savages, which is what they said about all Indians and throughout all North America. Uh, but they said we were very warlike uh, and we were cannibals. Uh, so of those three things, we were none of those. For the most part, California Indians were not warlike. We would have disputes every now and then. Uh, but for the most part, we traded extensively. The Chumash are famous and well known for, for having trade routes and, and certain villages that were major trade centers that other tribes and other villages from 50, 60, even 100 miles away would come to Chumash villages to trade because we had so many resources here and we had our shell beat money uh, that was considered to be valuable. And I thought about that gentleman who had, I could not convince that we were not cannibals. And when I read that in Dr. Madley's book, I tell that story to young people all the time that when a label is put on a group of people, that this whole group of people are lazy, this whole, this whole group of people are stupid, and that these, this whole group of people are inferior, subhuman, savages, 
Those labels can last not just for years, but that label was put on in 1850. And in the year 2002 or three, whatever year that was, that label was still there. So I tell young people, uh, you have to be very care careful when, when you use a label uh, of somebody. Uh, and if labels do stick for that long, let's, let's, let's start using labels of, of how loving people are, how kind and generous people are. And uh, that uh, uh, the Hispanic population that comes to California are extremely hardworking people. And I know that because I grew up in Bakersfield in Hanford, California, farming country. And, and I saw the start of the farm laborers uh, union. My father met Cesar Chavez and said he was a wonderful soft-spoken man, uh, very humble. And he, my father was very impressed when he met Cesar Chavez. So uh, labels are something that uh, I, I've fought against all my life when people try to put labels on, on my tribes or put labels on me. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a human, human being. I have the same feelings and emotions and the same abilities uh, as, as anyone else. Um, I'll talk briefly about the Shumash. I'm gonna assume that since all of you are from the Central Coast area that that, that you know a lot about the, the, the Shumash, uh, I'll point out five things. And if anyone has questions, I'll expound on, on, on those during the Q&A. Uh, uh, when I go to schools, I, I tell the kids that the Shumash are famous for five things. Uh, we're famous for our shell bead money and the word Shumash actually means shell bead money or shell bead money makers. So we would get very small ovella shells. There may be uh, at, at best, uh, uh, a, a half inch long, and they're very delicate and difficult to work with. And we would make perfect circular beads and drill a hole in the center. Uh, and, and I found, I was on Santa Rosa Island last week, and while we were excavating, uh, I found two, uh, not much thicker than a sewing needle and about an inch long. And those were, they were made from chert. Uh, hard stone, sharp stone. And those were the drills used to drill the small hole in the center of that bead that is at best a quarter inch, three eighths of an inch in diameter, very small, less than a half inch in diameter. Uh, so we're famous for our shell bead money that was traded throughout all of California, Nevada, Arizona, and well into New Mexico. Uh, we're famous for our canoes, our tamales, they're plank canoes. So they're not made uh, from one tree like a dugout canoe. We would literally make our own boards, our own two by six, two by eights. And we would drill holes in them and glue and tie them together, putting board on top of board. Um, and they look like this. Like that one down there on the bottom. Uh, they're very unique. Only two tribes in all the West Coast made plank canoes, and they're both here in, in Central and, and Southern California, the Tongva, uh, Gabrielino, and the Shumash. Uh, so they're very unique canoes. Uh, we're famous for our basket weavers. Our basket weavers were some of the greatest basket weavers you'll find anywhere in the world. And you, go to, you can go to museums all around the world, England, Germany, Australia, Russia, uh, uh, France, Spain. Uh, they have Shumash baskets at their museums. Uh, our basket weavers were made some of the most beautiful and functional baskets uh, anywhere. Our rock art is considered some of the most beautiful, unique rock art you will find anywhere in the world. Any of you that have had the opportunity to go to paint it cave or to paint it rock out in the Carrizo, that's some of the most spectacular rock art that archaeologists, not, not the Shumash people, that's what archaeologists and anthropologists say about our rock art. And the Shumash are one of the oldest tribes in North America. When I was on Santa Rosa Island, uh, not this time, but the last time last year, uh, I went by where the Arlington Spring Man was discovered. And the Arlington Spring Man is just the leg bone of a Shumash, mo a Shumash bone. 
It's just the leg bone of a shoe mash man that was found in 1959. But when they did carbon dating testing on that leg bone of that shoe mash man, it was determined that that leg bone is between 13,000 to 13,500 years old, making it the oldest human remains found in North America today. Uh, so the Shumash are one of the oldest tribes in North America. The Tataviam uh, were a very small tribe. Uh, so I'm on the elders council of the Fernandino, like San Fernando, Fernandino Tataviam Band of Mission Indians. Uh, our territory covers most of the San Fernando Valley, the Santa Clarita Valley, and my family actually uh, traces back to a village called Chagoyanga and Magic Mountain is literally built over it. Uh, and uh, going out towards Gorman and out towards Palmdale and Lancaster. Uh, so we were a very small tribe. Uh, they estimate it at, uh, when the mission period started, there might have been uh, 1,000 to 1,500. And by the end of the uh, bounty system in 1873, uh, there was less than a hundred of us. So we were pretty close to being extinct. Uh, but we, uh, both my, and my Shumash family, we traced back to the village of Tuapu, as Cornell said, Cornell said uh, which is uh, in modern day Simi Valley. Uh, and, and let me say something. Uh, uh, I, I, I was going to apologize, but I, I think this is a, a good point. Uh, the information that I sent Cornell uh, was about five years old. Uh, so since then, uh, I, I've uh, been able to, uh, the family's been able to do a little bit more research, getting into San Fernando mission records, uh, talking to uh, some uh, anthropologists, John Johnson and various anthropologists like that. And my, we traced back that uh, my family was brought to the San Fernando mission starting in 1799. And we traced back that uh, instead of the village of Paying, that my great, great, great grandfather came from the village of Chagoyanga. Uh, so like many California native families, uh, we're, we're always researching our ancestry and learning more about villages and, and tribal connections. Um, it, it's, it's an ongoing process for many of us. Uh, you have to be a detective. Uh, so uh, the, like I said, the, the Tataviam, the one thing we're famous for right now is uh, uh, many tribes in California do not have federal recognition, They're federally non-recognized tribes. The Ventureño Shumash from the Ventura era, area, the Barbareño Shumash from Santa Barbara, uh, Northern Shumash from San Luis Obispo County, uh, the Island Shumash, uh, the Mountain Shumash, the Shumash that lived in the mountains, we are all federally non-recognized. The Fernandino Tataviam are a federally non-recognized tribe, but we are currently under review uh, by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And uh, we're, we're through phase one. We have to try and explain uh, uh, one of the qualifications, uh, which is, uh, are we still at what is called a, an historic tribe, a tribe like the Navajo, the Hopi, uh, the, the Lakota, the, the Sioux, um, and it's a difficult uh, process to explain. So to kind of give you an idea of, of, of uh, when you're not fairly recognized, mostly it's because we've lost our land. Uh, so our land was taken away from us. We believe our land was stolen from us. Uh, we never signed a, 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 a treaty and uh, agreed to give our land to uh, Mexi uh, Spain, Mexico, uh, or the United States of, of America. Uh, uh, so if you're a, an Indian tribe and you don't have land, the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, the US government does not recognize you. But there's this big long process and we've been working on it for uh, close to 30 years. Uh, we've been under review for three years and we're just almost through the phase one. The phase two will take four to five more years. Uh, and that's, and we're on what is called the fast track. <laughs> you can believe that, that's the fast track. There's another, another process that gives a little bit more leeway, but it takes much longer. Uh, uh, so we went with the, the fast track and we're willing to take the risk of some of the 
uh, shortcomings of the fast track. Uh, so uh, I'll be 70 years old in a couple months. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I live long enough to find out if my tribe gets their federal recognition so that my kids and grandson uh, will, will have some benefits that, that I, I will never have. Um, and I'll answer questions about the Tataviam uh, later. Uh, I, I, so, so that's my, my family history, my tribal history. I, I'm involved with, with a lot of uh, different things. I, I've been involved with, with Indian causes and issues, which as you can tell by uh, what I've said so far, uh, can be extremely complex, uh, uh, very frustrating at times. Uh, I was interviewed by a cultural anthropologist from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And she asked me, some of the same questions that she did, some of the other tribal members, our, our tribal president and senators and some of the other elders on, their, on our elders council, that she said, it doesn't seem like the Fernandinho Chataviam did tribal activities from 1900 to 1950. And I explained to her as best as I could without getting angry and frustrated, that one, I was born in 1951, so I wasn't alive during that time, but um, uh, I, I heard many of family stories from my pop and my grandmothers and my aunts and uncles. And she goes, well, it doesn't appear that the tribe, the families, and there's only three families in the whole Tataviam tribe. Like I said, we're a very small tribe. Uh, and she goes, but it doesn't seem like those, those three families, the, the tribal uh, families that were, that were uh, alive from 1900 to 1950 did tribal things. They didn't seem to get together, have gatherings. Uh, if an elder died, it didn't seem like, uh, we, I don't see anything of, of, of the families coming together to honor that elder. And I tried to as graciously as possible explain that the stories I heard from my grandmother my aunts and uncles and my pop was that it was extremely difficult to survive the depression. That my family was a typical poor family in America trying to survive the depression. You know, hand me down clothes, uh, shoes with holes in them. Uh, I, my, I remember my pop telling us stories of how when he was a very young boy, six, seven years old, eight years old, shining shoes for a nickel, for a penny uh, in downtown San Fernando. That he had his shoe shine box and he would set up in front of the barber shop and he would shine shoes to help bring in money uh, for the family when he was just a little boy. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you're the smallest minority, the smallest ethnic group uh, in, in, in an area, you're the last person on the totem pole usually to get the jobs, to get the, the handouts and things like that. So I tried to explain to her that, that I know that the depression was extremely difficult for, for my family and, and the other families. They, they stayed in touch, but it was a matter of putting your head down and working. And most people of color know exactly what I'm talking about when I say there's times you just have to put your head down and do the work. Uh, I've done it. Many people have done to survive. And then my family, my father uh, and, and many of my uh, uh, older cousins and uh, older uncles served in World War II and, and, and had to survive the war and then come back and start their life all over again. Uh, you know, try and, and, and get jobs. My, my family, uh, as Cornell said, uh, my grandfather worked in construction. My father worked in construction. Me and all my brothers worked in construction. I was the only one that would also do other things, teach preschool and, and uh, work juvenile probation. I've always enjoyed working with kids. Uh, but it, it's, it's, it's a long process to get federal recognized uh, and our odds are, are stacked against us. It's uh, probably about 90% of the, of the petitions from tribes that are trying to get federally recognized are rejected. At best, 10, 12 percent are approved. Uh, but you know, knock on wood, uh, if, if anyone can send out some positive energy and prayers for the Fernandino Tataviam before I die, 
uh, uh, I'll just be happy to know one way or the other. Uh, so now I want to talk a little bit about our uh, canoes, our tamoles. This is the one I've paddled in for the last 10, 12 years. This is Muktamai. It's owned by Sandy Inez. This is a 32 foot plank canoe. You can see the black lines. That's one board glued and tied to the board below it, and the board below that, and the board below that. It's about six boards deep. They're very heavy. Uh, the first one we built that I helped build uh, in 1997, this one here, which is Eliwuyun. She's 24 feet. I hope I'm not getting too much uh, glare from the light. Uh, uh, but she's a, a, a lot lighter. The 24 footer Eliwuyun uh, that made the first crossing in historic times. Uh, so let me give you a little brief history of our Tamol or canoe culture with Shumash people. We've been building these ocean canoes uh, for at least 3,000 years, I believe more like seven, 8,000 years. Uh, they're flat bottom plank canoes so that we get boards, make our own boards, and we glue and tie them together. The reason we make flat bottom is flat bottom canoes carry a lot of weight. We build them to take trade items out to the islands, Santa Kappa, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, San Miguel. Those four islands off our coast were Shumash islands. So we took trade items back and forth to the islands, visited family and friends on the islands. And then also to go out into the ocean and fish and bring back fish to our villages along the coast uh, uh, for food. A 24 foot canoe uh, tamol like Eliwuyun can easily carry over 300 pounds of fish or 300 pounds of trade items. We know this because Flat bottom canoes are very tippy. They rock back and forth. If you put some weight in your canoe and get some of it underwater, that stabilizes it. Then it only rocks a little bit. Uh, so we put about 300 pounds to 350 pounds of sandbags or ballast to get some of our tamol or canoe underwater to stabilize it so it's not tippy. Uh, so that's why we know it can carry uh, 300 pounds. We can catch 300 pounds of fish in it easily. The 32 footer weighs 500 pounds empty. Uh, we put six, 700 pounds of ballast in her and six paddlers. So we're pulling well over 2000 pounds of canoe when we paddle from Channel Islands Harbor, which is Oxnard, California. That's where we usually leave from because from that harbor, it's uh, 20 miles to Limu the island that we call Santa Cruz. And we went for the first time in 2001. Uh, and when I say the first time in historic times, uh, we've been building the canoes, uh, ocean canoes for several thousand years. Uh, and then somewhere around the 1830s or 1840s during the mission period, we stopped building them because we were the slave laborers, uh, and the farm workers, the ranch hands, the cooks, the maids, uh, for for everyone in California. When it was under the control of Spain, when it was under the control of Mexico, and when it was under the control of America. And we were slaves during during America, during the first uh, uh, 15 years of California's history. Uh, we called us indentured servants, uh, but we were slaves. Uh, so we stopped building our tamoles in, in the 1830s. Uh, so there was a, 150 years that a traditional Shumash canoe did not make any trips from the mainland out to the islands. And I was part of that first crew and, and part of the 25, 30 paddlers that left uh, uh, September 8th on 2001. And we've gone 12 more times since then. Uh, we didn't go in 2019 because it was windy. And we didn't go this year because of COVID. And next year will be the 20th anniversary. And I was just messaging one of our just brilliant, strong women paddlers, uh, Eva Pagaline. And uh, we, we both miss each other. We both miss our, our canoe family, our Tamol family. Uh, and I said to not be on the water this year was, was really rough for, for many of us. And as I said earlier, I'm getting towards the end of my paddling career. I'll, I'll be 70 next year when we go out to, to 
to Santa Cruz Island, but I will paddle. And I will paddle a full ship of two to three hours. Our canoes are very deep, so you have to paddle on your knees. Our paddles are made out of wood. They're over 11 feet long. Uh, so it takes a lot of upper body strength. Uh, I work out religiously. I go to the gym five days a week and lift weights. And the trainers there all think I'm crazy because I do the same seven or eight exercises over and over and over. All I want to do is build up paddling muscles, which are my shoulders and my back. Uh, because we're on our knees, you don't use your legs or your core that much, but a little bit. Um, so um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show a couple more pictures uh, of our uh, tamales. Um, uh, I think they're, they're beautiful. Uh, this picture here is from uh, 2001. Uh, it, we left at 3.45 in the morning. That's Gilbert Ansueta, a dear friend of mine. Uh, my son is right behind him. So I paddled with my son uh, on that first crossing and my grandson is 12. I hope to paddle long enough to get my grandson in and paddle with him. So we left at 3.45, that's about three o'clock in the afternoon. It took us over 11 hours and we're carrying the, the, the tamale ashore. Uh, and then we had a big ceremony and, a, and we camped out and, and told stories and sang traditional songs. Uh, uh, it, it was a great, uh, a, a, a great day. I said, we, we leave when it's dark. Uh, now we leave a little bit earlier. Uh, so uh, these uh, two pictures here are, are from 2017, um, and uh, we leave about three o'clock in the morning now. During a couple of times, we've left about 2.30. The first crew are called dark water paddlers because they leave when it's dark. It's an honor to be a dark water paddler. I've been in that first crew uh, about seven or eight times. I've lost count. Uh, the honor is, uh, to be in the first crew, to paddle when it's dark, which is an incredible experience. Uh, and we put mostly our strongest, most experienced paddlers because they paddle from whatever time you leave. One morning we left at 2.30 in the morning and I was in that first crew and we paddled from 2.30 to 6.30 because we wait for the, for daylight so we can safely see and make a crew change. So as I said, uh, we, that's, that's us making a crew change. We, we get a fresh paddlers, we put them in, in those rubber Zodiacs with a little motor and, and we bring them out to the Tamal and one person gets out of the Tamal and into the Zodiac and one person gets out of the Zodiac into the, into the Tamal. But the first crew paddles at a minimum three hours, sometimes three and a half, four hours. So dark water paddlers are very respected. If any of you, after I'm through talking, want to see a video, um, Google this. I hope you can see that. It says dark water journey, Eva Pagaling. So the young lady that I was messaging and sent, sending messages to just before the program started, uh, we both signed off with... Uh, uh, love you and miss you. Uh, they we made a they made a video about the dark water paddlers, and Eva Pag Pagaline was one of the first. She was a second. We've had one other woman uh, be a dark water paddler, and uh, her father is one of our captains, Reggie Pagaline. He's one of my dear friends, and I feel pretty confident that uh, Eva without a doubt, is one of our stronger paddlers. And let me be clear on this. She's not one of our stronger women paddlers. She's one of our strongest paddlers. Uh, if I was gonna pick a crew of, of the six best paddlers, strongest paddlers to be in the, in the Tamol uh, move to mine with six paddlers, she would be one of them. Uh, but I think uh, I, uh, try and encourage her and mentor, mentor her as much as I can. She's like a niece, even though we're not related. And uh, much like the Hawaiians and many other cultures, uh, we, we all call each other cuz anyway. Uh, but uh, I think she's gonna be our first woman 
captain in, in modern times. Uh, it was the Brotherhood of the Tumult that built the canoes and were the paddlers and the seamen and the fishermen. But there's an old Shumash traditional story that uh, says one day the Wot, which is our leader, our chief, the, the Wot's daughter was out fishing in her tumult. And Coyote played a trick on her. Now, there's a myth and legend that's thousands of years old. That, and that story is a very old story um, about the chief's daughter going out fishing in her tumult. There's a, a very, very, very good chance that women have paddled in our tumults uh, uh, for thousands of years. Uh, and, and the Shumash are one of those cultures that we've always had women leaders. Uh, that uh, lots of times uh, the Wot or chief of the family, uh, uh, the Paha, uh, the spiritual leader, will pass on his title to his son. But lots of times he doesn't have a son. He feels his daughter is, will be a good leader. He passes it on. Uh, that leadership role, that, that chief, that woke role to his daughter. And to give you an example, uh, when the European people, the Spanish first came down the coast of California, it was reported by the Spanish that on the islands, the, the, the villages on Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa and San Miguel, and they're all pretty close. They're all within five, six miles of each other. Uh, that each vote, each leader of each village from the islands would, would, get, would have big meetings once or twice a year. And they would pick the head vote of all the votes, of all the leaders. So there might be 20 leaders from 20 villages on these three islands. And they would pick one to be the leader of the leaders. And at European contact in the fifth, in the mid 1500s, late 1500s, the head vote of all the islands was a woman. So we have always uh, honored and respected uh, our women. And if they're capable of, of being great hunters, great fishermen, uh, paddlers and, and leaders, they will, they, they have and will be uh, in, in the Shumash culture and the Chitaviam are very similar. Uh, Before I uh, open it up for Q and A, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a little story because everyone loves a, a good story. I learned this story from Tony Romero, a very respected Shumash elder from San Ynez. I've never seen it written down. I just heard Tony tell it dozens of times. And after hearing him telling it, uh, I asked him for permission if I could tell the story. And he gave me permission to, to share this story about Muhu, the great horned owl. Now, long, long ago, Muhu did not, was not an owl. He was a songbird. Muhu was originally a, sound, a songbird. He didn't look anything like Muhu, the great horned owl. He had a round, smooth, slick head. He had little brown, beady eyes. And he had a long, pointy beak that he would whistle and sing beautiful songs. And all the animals would come to listen to Muhu, the songbird, sing his songs. And one day, Muhu, the songbird, was up in a tree. And Hoos, the grizzly bear, came by as he was whistling and singing his songs. <whistles> Muhu loved Otis Redding. I apologize for that. After a few minutes, who's the grizzly bear goes, Moo, come here, I want to give you a hug because I love your song so much. I'll just give you a little hug. And Moo thought, well, he seems friendly. He said he just wants to give me a little hug. And Moo, the songbird, flew down. When he got close to who's the grizzly bear, he saw how big he is, claws as big as my fingers, seven feet tall on his hind legs, 600 pounds. And Moo, the songbird, got scared and flew away. The next day, Moo the songbird was curious about who's the grizzly bear. Was he friendly? Did he really want to just give me a little hug? 
And he went back to that same tree and Muhu the songbird with his beautiful long beak, his round, smooth, slick head, those little brown beady eyes was whistling and singing beautiful songs. <whistles> he also left Frank. Once again, I apologize. Who's the grizzly bear goes, Moo, come here. I just want to give you a little hug of appreciation because I love your songs. They're so beautiful. Moo thought, okay, he seems friendly. He said he just wants to give me a little hug and he flew down. When he got close to Hoos, Hoos reached out and grabbed him with those big old paws and he gave him a big old hug. He goes, oh, Moo, I love your song so much. I'm going to give you just a little hug. And he went, Ugh! And he gave him a little hug, but a little hug to a grizzly bear is a big hug to any of us. And those feather ears that Moo, the great horned owl has popped out. That's how he got him. And Moo says, Hoos, don't give me any more hugs. You don't know how strong you are. And Hoos, the grizzly bear goes, oh, let me give you one more little hug. He went, oh, and give him another little hug. He hugged him so hard, his brown beady eyes popped out and got real big and turned yellow. Moo says, Hoos, don't give me any more hugs. You don't know how strong you are. You're going to kill me. And who's grizzly bear says, okay, I won't give you any more hugs. I'm just going to give you a kiss. And he went, Aah! he gave him a big, wet, sloppy kiss on that beautiful long beak. If any of you have ever kissed a grizzly bear, you know they have really bad breath. His breath was so bad that when he gave Moohoo, the songbird, that kiss, his beak went and bent over. And that's how Muhu the songbird became Muhu the great horned owl. From Tony Romero, a very respected uh, Schumann elder from Santa Inez that has since gone on to the spirit world. I hope you like that story. Let me open it up for some Q and A, um, and uh, I'll, I'll try and answer as many questions as I can in the next fifteen or twenty minutes, and then I have another interview uh, with a reporter. At 7.30. 7.30, perfect. All right, thank you so much, Alan. We do all love a great story. And thanks for um, interpreting your whistles for us. <laughs> <laughs> Young people out there don't know who Frank Sinatra is. Strangers in the night. Uh, yeah, thanks for your time. Thanks for sharing your personal experiences and for all your knowledge. Um, Cause we do have plenty of questions that people want to know more about. Uh, you ended your discussion with the um, tamoles, the canoes. Someone was wondering, you mentioned gluing them. They were wondering what the early tribes used for glue. Uh, the, the early tribes used the, the natural tar that seeps up. So Carpinteria Beach, Morro Bay has, has a lot of it. Uh, I, I found it here at Ventura. Um, and then they would mix uh, pine pitch, the sap from pine trees. So they would mix pine pitch, the natural tar has faltum and it was called yolk. And it's a very strong glue. We use the best marine glues that you can buy. We buy the strongest glue and we mix black paint so it looks like the tar and our canoes still leak. <laughs> they all leak. So in the old days, they would take a, 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 a young child and give them a, a, a large abalone shell like this and they'd be bailing out the water as the men were fishing and, and, and paddling. Um, we're, uh, where are Shumash sacred sites on the central coast? Um, you, you know, um, I, I believe, uh, when you look at our sky people, I tell a creation story and the sky people are sky eagle, the golden eagle, uh, sky coyote, sky lizard, sky snake, the sun, the moon and morning star. One of the reasons eagle is a very respected uh, animal is because they can fly higher than, than any other bird. So they take our prayers up to the great spirit or whoever it is that we're praying to. So just most mountain tops, when you look at certain areas, you know, people say that the seven sisters uh, going from San Luis Obispo to Morro Bay, that almost every, every peak, I said, we've been here for 13,000 years. So you can pretty much guarantee that, that, that wherever there were villages and every town in, in, in San Luis Obispo is built over a Schumann village. They're, they're very, around the 
And if you just walk out and look, where's the highest spot close to that village? That's where they went up and did ceremony. Uh, but uh, uh, Moro Rock is, is very sacred. Mount Pinos is, is one of the most sacred. Um, uh, uh, Magoo, there's another uh, down boy. Uh, 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 just before you get into Malibu, there's uh, Magoo Rock, which is kind of similar to Moro Rock. Uh, that, that was um, sacred. And um, if you ever have an opportunity to go out to uh, paint a rock in the Carrizo, it's a national monument. Uh, that was a very sacred, but but there's probably hundreds of, of sacred spots, uh, mountaintops, because we always want to go up to the highest point so our prayers go up. And with that, someone, of course, was surprised that Magic Mountain was built on top of <laughs> uh, the village. So they were wondering, were there not site monitors, or it sounds like buildings are still being built on. Yeah, well, you know, sadly, um, we, we didn't get uh, laws to, to protect uh, burial sites and village sites uh, in, until the, the 1980s. So, so things that were, you know, built prior to that. I live in Ventura and um, the village of Shishalope, which is one of those major trade centers, um, uh, basically the 101 went right through the village. So it, it was pretty much destroyed. Um, our, our educated guess is there's, there's many uh, construction workers that took home uh, many uh, stone bowls and pestles and arrowheads during construction of, of things like shopping centers and, and uh, Magic Mountain and things like, like that. Uh, so it, it's, it's one of the things that we're, we're uh, thankful for that uh, uh, it's gotten much better and, and government and, and city, county, state, federal uh, ha have to consult with, with tribes. Uh, so uh, th things are much, much more protected than they were just uh, 20, 30 years ago. Still a problem, still difficult to deal with. Uh, Marshall's wondering how else can the residents and government of San Luis or surrounding areas be better neighbors and a more supportive community to the Shumash and Tatavian people? What would you like to see? Um, well, there's, uh, there, there's uh, a lot of ways, like I said, uh, the only federally recognized uh, Shumash tribe is, is San Inez. Uh, so that's, that's just for the the Shumash people that trace back uh, to the villages around the San Inez mission. And when you look at where the San Inez mission is, uh, that was one of the very small remote missions, probably one of the smallest remote missions at that time. So they're a very small tribe. Uh, depending on who you talk to, there's somewhere between uh, you know, four to 5,000 people that can trace back Shumash ancestry. Um, uh, and there's only 300 San Inez tribal members. So the majority of, of Shumash people are, are fairly not recognized. So the, uh, uh, the, the great thing about uh, the times we're in, you can Google anything. You can Google dark water journey and Eva Pagaline and that, that video is gonna come up. It's about a 15 minute video. Uh, you can Google Northern Shumash and the various nonprofit, uh, I mean, non federally recognized tribes and groups will come up. And lots of times there's more than one group. And if you see, see, see the, the local groups doing anything, uh, you know, please uh, support them. Uh, uh, but anybody can write letters uh, and just send an email to your congressperson saying that uh, uh, they should support the federal recognition of local tribes. Uh, so you, anyone uh, can, can write to any congressperson, any senator, any politician, uh, city, county, state, federal, and, say, and, and, and encourage them to, to support uh, all the federally non-recognized tribes. And they know who they are. They know who we are. We're, we're out there and we work with the federally recognized tribes. Uh, uh, and uh, if they're under review, like the Fernandino Tataviam, 
anybody can write a, uh, an email to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and it's called OFA, Office of Federal Acknowledgement, and it's with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And you can go to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and their Office of Federal Acknowledgement, and you anybody can see the list of tribes that are being under review. And if there's a tribe there that, that you want to support, maybe there's a tribe from, from uh, where uh, your family is from back east or in the Midwest, or, or if, if you see any California tribes, you go, you know, I, I want to write letters of support that, the, that, that you know these tribes, you know that they're still here and they're still tribal people and they should be fairly recognized. And as we know how politicians work, they respond to pressure. Uh, so, and then for, and I'll get in a shameless plug. Sophie, I was ready for this. Uh, uh, this is uh, for my Fernandinho Tataviam tribe. If any of you Google Tataviam Land Conservancy, I try to write a little bit bigger there. It says right there. Um, and I don't know if you can read the, the writing, but I'll read it to you right now. The primary purpose of the Tataviam Land Conservancy is to conserve lands within the traditional territory of the tribe for cultural enrichment and educational uses. Uh, so what we're trying to do, the Fernandinho Tataviam Land Conservancy, is to acquire land. So we have already uh, acquired two parcels of land, one, both of them about 50 acres. Um, and um, uh, we, will, we will put that land uh, 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 as open space and as a nature preserve, but we will oversee it. So I had a, a, a land conservancy meeting last night and we don't even have enough money to pay insurance. And we need insurance now that we, now that we are legally acquiring the land. Uh, we, we need money uh, to, to qualify, uh, to be recognized by other organizations like the Sierra Club, uh, the Santa Monica Mountain Conservancy. Uh, so uh, if, if there's any native groups uh, in your area that are trying to work with the Sierra Club, uh, that's another way you can, you can help your local tribal people. Uh, they respond to pressure. So the Sierra Club, uh, they usually only reach out to, to us when they, they need to trot someone out in front of the camera at a public meeting. <laughs> if this native person doesn't want, wants, wants this land preserved as open space so that we can go hiking and go and for tribal people so we can go collect our plants, uh, and then after the meetings and the TV cameras are shut off, they don't reach out to us very much more. So encourage any environmental groups that you have in San Luis Obispo County to work with the local tribal people, you know, either individual tribal people to get the tribal perspective or the various tribal groups. And in San Luis Obispo, there's, there's I don't know an exact number, but there's three or four, there's a, uh, the Northern Chumash, a couple of Northern Chumash tribal groups. Uh, there's uh, Selenian uh, tribal groups, uh, but just to encourage them to reach out to the Selenian and Sh Northern Chumash people is, is important. The, the environmental groups kind of forget about us sometimes. Um, uh, state parks, uh, you know, make sure that, that Los Padres National Forest is reaching out to us. And I'm not sure if there's it, what other, uh, I know, Los Padre National Forest goes a little bit into San Luis Obispo County, and I'm not sure what other state, county, county uh, uh, forest and, and national parks there are in San Luis Obispo County, but they need encouragement to reach out to tribal people. Perfect, thanks. In addition, are there any specific uh, legal policies or initiatives right now that you know of that we can support? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, the, the, the other thing that, uh, and it's in Santa Barbara County, but, it, but it's pretty close to, to, to you guys. And you know, I said, that's, once again, that's Sandy Inez. And uh, uh, 
they, they have the casino and they're federally recognized and, and uh, but, but still they, they need support and they're gonna be the first Chumash tribe or group to open their, their very own cultural center, their very own museum. And for Shumash people, that's extremely important. Because uh, uh, many of us, this is what we believe. I, I, I do things with the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. And uh, they have a, a tamole that was built in 1912 by a Shumash elder named Fernando Lombrado. And uh, they have it on display at the museum. And what most of us didn't know is that the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History doesn't own that tomorrow. It's actually owned by a museum in San Diego, which seems strange, but that happens all the time. So they had a group of, of Chumash people there with the San Diego Museum people and the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History people as they were negotiating the, the new contract. And I pointed out to them that everything they have that is shoe match. The Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History has the largest collection of shoe match baskets in the world. Beautiful baskets. And I reminded the director of the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, everything you have doesn't belong to you, it belongs to us. Those are our baskets. That's our tumult. Uh, those artifacts, those stone bowls, those pestles, those points, those knife points, spear points, those are, those are ours. And at some point, it may not be in my lifetime, at some point you're gonna have to give them back to us. So for San Inez to open their own cultural center, I think it'll be open in 2021. I was, I was by there about three months ago. To, we had a work day in our tomorrow. We haven't put them in the water. Uh, but their the walls are up and, and, and hopefully they'll they'll be opening up pretty soon. Please, uh, those of you, it's a great day. Move from wine country, drive on down to San Inez and support them when that museum opens because that'll that that's gonna open the door for other Shumash run cultural centers and museums to 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 be built in the future. It'll set a precedent. So that, that that's another way you can you can support. And if you know any, any shoe match people, take us out for lunch. <laughs> Perfect. That's great. Thank you. Um, so in light of it, so with it being Veterans Day, there was um, Native American Veterans Memorial, which just opened today in Washington D.C. Um, on the Smithsonian grounds. Um, someone wanted you to just respond to that. Comment on that. Well, as, as I opened, I'm, I'm the son of a Marine and my, my father was, was proud that he served in, in World War II and always wore his Marine emblem. The picture that I showed of him later on life, he had that. Um, but I, I, I think most people know that, know, know this fact, but if they don't, I'll, 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 I'll just state it again. Uh, uh, tribal people in America, indigenous people, Native Americans, whatever, uh, adjectives you want to use to describe us, we, we serve at a higher rate than any ethnic group in America. Uh, and uh, we have served in, in every uh, major war, every uh, conflict, and, serve in, and served in all branches of the, of the armed services. And I personally believe, and this is just my personal opinion, it's, it's because we love this land. Uh, and I say this all the time. I was born in San Fernando, California, uh, uh, because my ancestors for the last uh, uh, five generations prior to me, six generations, uh, were brought to the San Fernando Mission. And, and I'll, I'll die somewhere in, in, in Chumash or Tataviam territory because it's my home and I'll, I'll never leave it. Uh, so we're always, uh, Native peoples, proud of our service. Uh, to, to America, we we love it as as much as as, as any Democrat or any Republican, uh, and and we're we're thankful that, that our soldiers and warriors are are, are being acknowledged 
as all soldiers and warriors should be acknowledged. So. Great, thanks. In addition to the museums, how, um, how do you currently capture and preserve your stories and history of each tribe? Um, uh, okay, this person isn't a plant. And this is this is a shameless <laughs> plug, uh, but um, there's uh, a, a lot of ways. Uh, there's uh, a, a major revitalization of our canoe culture. There's a major revitalization of our uh, uh, of language. So there's language classes. Tribes are having uh, language classes. Even the federally non-recognized tribe. I know this. I know the Northern Chumash, and, and I apologize if any of them are listening. Uh, they have a very long name uh, Yak Yak, uh, and it's, it's too difficult for, for me uh, to, and I don't want to mispronounce it, but they have language classes. Uh, but uh, over the last 20 years, uh, we've realized the importance of, of filming and documenting. So uh, I, I made a, about a 30 minute video of, of uh, two or three Shumash stories, the, the, the Muhu Great Horned Owl story, and a couple of Shumash songs that, that I have uh, that hopefully I'll start being able to, to mass produce and I'll, I'll sell uh, on, uh, on my website, but I will put in a shameless plug for this. Everyone can see this. Uh, this will be coming out uh, within the next uh, month or so. Uh, and this is Tata the Tataviam Toi, a tribal story by uh, Alan Salazar Hutu Yayak. Uh, and illustrations by Mona Lewis. So uh, um, uh, we, we have, um, uh, Ernestine DeSoto has, has a wonderful book that you can buy at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Uh, I have a dear friend, Cindy Albitri, who is uh, Tongva Gabrielino. And uh, I was talking about my, my book to the archeologist I was working with last week. And he goes, well, Cindy Albitri just, just did a book. So we're, we're, we're starting to get out there. We're, we're doc, film, putting things on film to document our stories, our traditional myth and legends. So the video I made are a traditional shoe match myth and legends. Uh, Julie Tumamite, who's a wonderful storyteller uh, in, in, from the Ventura, Ohio area and her family are uh, island shoe match and have, have connections to several villages within shoe match. And, and she's been uh, videotaped and so that th those are, are, are saved. Um, but I, I think in the next five years, you're, you're going to be able to see, you'll be seeing at museums more videos of, of traditional songs, bird, bird singers, uh, traditional stories being told by storytellers, uh, uh, Gilbert and Sleta, uh, Ernestine De Soto, uh, Dennis Garcia, Cindy Alpitri. Uh, there, there, are, there are more and more uh, stories out there. And if there's any young people listening, uh, I, I've realized the importance of storytelling as I've gotten older. And um, I'm at the point where as I want to pass that on. And what I hope to do when COVID is over, I want to start having storytelling workshops. And this is the first story I tell everybody, you young lady, that's reading the questions, and everyone that's listening, learn your family story. So when I opened and I said, I get my tribal uh, uh, ancestry from my father's side of the family. Uh, I, I know the story of my great grandfather uh, where my grandmother and my grandfather came from. Uh, and I always encourage young, young children, sit down with mom and pop. And, and, and when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, old enough to remember, ask them where they were born, what jobs they've had. Ask them what jobs grandma and grandpa, uh, what jobs in education, and, and where did your great grandparents live? Uh, so fortunately for me, because of that San Fernando mission, we were able to get San Fernando mission records. I can go back that my great, great, great grandfather, Francisco, was one of three uh, Indian men that was given a land grant from the San Fernando mission in the 1830s. It was a square league of land that's 1400, yeah, 1400 acres. No, I, I, I apologize, 4,400 acres. 
uh, those three men were given in basically three families. Uh, he, he passed it on to his daughter. So my great, great grandmother was, was, was a tribal leader and owned this land, but they only owned it for that 4,000 acres for literally three or four years. And the Spanish and Mexican politicians started taxing and assessing them more taxes and more taxes and more taxes until they took that land away. That 4,400 acres became Rancho Encino. And then in the early 1900s became the town of Encino. So when I say my land, my tribal land was, was stolen, we never signed a treaty for that 4,400 acres. It became the town of Encino, some of the most valuable land in the state of California. We were never compensated for it. And that's not a unique story. That story happened to thousands of California tribal people. Nothing unique about my family. Incredible stories, and there's nothing unique about them. It happened to, 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 I could just list family after family after family. Well, and timing wise, you said that was what, 18? 18... 1830. So uh, that's when, when, when California was being uh, transitioning from under the control of Spain to Mexico. Uh, and uh, both, both Spain and Mexico uh, granted Native people citizenship. So they realized, oh, wait, they're citizens. Well, we'll just tax them until they can't pay the taxes. My great grandfather, Antonio Maria Ortega, was, was one of a group of eight men that was given a smaller parcel of land by the mission priest in the early 1870s. And Charles McClay and Mr. Porter from Porter Ranch in the, off the 118 now uh, realized that California, when they realized there was these eight families that had, and I don't, I don't think it was very much land, 50, 60 acres in, in almost downtown San Fernando, uh, um, because they were working to keep the mission going in the 1860s and 70s, the missions were really struggling. They, they didn't have any, any money coming in. Uh, and it was, it's basically the tribal people that helped build the mission. Those families, the, the Ortega family, the Ortiz family, the Garcia Cook families, they were all working there and, and the mission priests uh, in 1870 gave, gave them some, some land to farm and to try and survive on. And Charles McClay, a early founding father of San Fernando realized that they, that there was these Indians that were living in, he, he considered them squatters because California Indians had no legal rights in 1870. It was still the bounty system. So he, he, took, them, he took them to court and took the land away and had them evicted. So my great grandfather was evicted off that land. So this happened twice to my, to my family, land taken away and they were fined. So my great grandfather had to work off his fines, which were, uh, 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 one fine was $500 and there was a couple of other smaller fines. So we think it was probably six, $700. Indian people in 1870 didn't have six or $7, let alone six or $700. So my great grandfather was an indentured servant. He had to work off that, that, that money and he worked for Charles, the Charles McClay ranch. And he didn't get paid, he was paying off his debt. And how did he how did he escape the bounty hunters and execution then? You, you know, we, we think that uh, his parents, my great great grandparents, uh, what what we've learned through family stories and um, and San Fernando Mission records is that uh, I come from a long line, and my father was a plasterer. He worked with these his whole life, and he was very proud that he was a journeyman plasterer, and he took pride. Uh, in, in, in doing quality work. Every one of his, his sons, we, we all were, were scolded if, if we didn't do things nice and clean, neat. Uh, and that's the way my great grandfather was and my great great grandparents and so on and so on. They were hard workers, highly skilled workers. And when you look at, at craftsmen, craftsmanship, uh, of the Chumash, Tataviam, all California tribes, the Pomos were, were great basket weavers. We were highly skilled people when it comes to craftsmanship. 
that's what's that's that's the 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 when California became a state, there was 140,000 California tribal people in the whole state. By the end of the bounty system in 1873, definitely by 1880, they estimate that tribal population throughout all of California had dropped from 140,000 to 15,000. And many experts think that it was less than 15,000. So there were a few tribes that became extinct and there were many tribes that were close to extinction. What the ones that did survive is because, like I said, we we were the we were the Indian cowboys. We were the vaqueros. We were Indian vaqueros. We were Indian cowboys, and we were good, excellent horsemen. We were we were valued. The ones that survived was because they were valued as as highly skilled, hardworking people, and that's tribal people across America. We're, we're, they're all highly skilled, hardworking people. Awesome. All right, we're getting close on time, but we have <laughs> a million questions left. Um, so we'll try to get as many in as we can. 10 more minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, does it make you sad or offend you when sports teams use terms like Redskins for their team name or mascot? Uh, it, 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 it does irritate me. Um, I think many people of color will, will, will tell you, 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 you know, you, you, you realize the hand that you're dealt. And um, uh, if, if, you, if, if you worry about it too much, you, you know, you're gonna have a miserable life. So you, you try and make your life as, as, as pleasurable as possible. But it, 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 it bothers me, I think it's wrong. And I will share this quick story. I put a curse on the Cleveland Indians over 20 years ago. And the first year I put a curse on the Cleveland Indians, they made it all the ways to the World Series. They were up three games to two and just about to win that fourth game when uh, the team they were playing, uh, uh, and it might have been Tampa Bay, um, uh, got a run and pulled that game out and then took it to three to three and then they won the, the, the seventh game and the Cleveland Indians lost. Then they were lousy and it was because of my curse and because they had that cartoon character of Chief Wahoo on their baseball cap that if you don't think that's an insult, then, then you, 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 you need to get your head out of the sand and understand you know, racial equality. You need to go to the dictionary and read that definition. But um, the next time they made it, it was the exact same thing. They were up three games to one on the Chicago Cubs. And if there's any baseball fans out there, you know what happened to that series. The Cubs came back from 3-1 three, three, and won their first World Series in over 50 years or whatever it was. The curse was lifted. Um, and I have still not removed that curse from the Cleveland Indians. They got rid of Chief Wahoo, but they took way too long. Any Cleveland fans out there? I'll remove the I'll remove the curse from the Cleveland Indians if you make a thousand dollar donation to the Oak Brook Shoe Mash Museum in Thousand Oaks. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, someone's wondering if you have written a book, considered writing a book, and or are there books on the shoe mash? Um, I, I, I hope to write uh, a, a book about the history of, of our maritime culture as I, as best as I know it um, uh, and my involvement uh, in the the last 23 years uh, in, in, uh, with our tamales. So uh, it, as I said, this is something I'm extremely proud of. Um, uh, it, it's a very small select group. Uh, there's probably uh, less than um, 200 shoe mash people that can even say they've been in a shoe mash, a traditional canoe tamale. Um, there's probably uh, less than a hundred shoe mesh people that can say they've paddled in one of the crossings from the mainland to 
to Santa Cruz County. And there's only six of us right now that can say we've paddled in all of the crossings from the mainland to the islands in modern times. And I'm one of them. So I want to write a, a, a book about the incredible experiences. And I, I've, I've been blessed. I've had so many incredible experiences. Uh, uh, I, have, I have friendships. Uh, uh, and not just Shumash people. I mean, the, the Bar Santa Barbara Maritime uh, Museum, uh, their first director, Ed Casano, and his, his daughter was, was uh, about seven or eight years old on our first crossing. And I still stay in touch with, with, with uh, uh, Tara Rose. And she's just a wonderful young woman. Uh, 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 and, and she's uh, uh, going to be a marine biologist. Uh, very intelligent. Uh, we're, we're, as I say, we, we, we have uh, uh, our, our, our tamoles are not just for, for Shumash people. We have tribal people from all around the world that have paddled with us. We've had uh, the Italian tribal people, the Irish tri tribal people, and the English tri tribal people, uh, Maori tribal people. Uh, Hawaiian tribal people, Filipino tribal people, and I say this all the time. We're all tribal people. Young lady, you're a tribal person. My people lived a tribal life 200 years ago. Your tribal people lived a tribal life probably about 2,000, maybe 3,000 years ago. But we all come from tribal cultures. We were all hunters and gatherers. Excellent. Uh, I think we need to let you go pretty soon. Any last, and I'm sorry for all the great questions we didn't have time to get to. Uh, any last thoughts? Any last um, thoughts for us? Someone asked, uh, what dreams do you have for the Shumash people in the near future? Um, well, um, as I mentioned, uh, I, I, I hope that, that we find out uh, that we, the Fernandina and Tataviam do get their federal recognition. Uh, letters of support to, to any congressperson would, would help. Uh, I think uh, letters to our Senator Kamala Harris uh, before she becomes our vice president would, would, would be great. Uh, to our new president, uh, Mr. Biden, uh, would, would be helpful. Um, uh, I, I, I I've learned over the years, I've been involved with, with, with protecting uh, ancient village sites and working with developers and government agents, uh, agencies, planning commissions, or supervisors, city councils uh, for over 25 years, probably more like 30 years. I started in the early 90s in Bakersfield uh, when I was living there and working with tribal people. And um, uh, it, it would be nice to see some, some big things, to see the uh, the Northern Shumash fairly recognized, the Ventureño, the Barbareño uh, Shumash uh, uh, fairly recognized before I uh, go up to the spirit world. But I, I've realized that you have to make tiny steps before you, before you can reach those big steps. And I've thought about this lot, a lot in, in the last couple months. And the last, couple, the last week, has just focused me on this one simple concept. Now is the time for all of us to sit down with our neighbors and have a cup of tea. I hate coffee. <laughs> you can have coffee if you want. I'm gonna have tea. Um, now is the time to, to sit down uh, and go to, go to a city council meeting and just listen and then wait till the meeting's over and talk to your council members one-on-one, -on -one, maybe about something that was brought up that night that you're interested in. We need to start having one-on-one -on -one conversations with our Republican friends, with our Democratic friends, with our independent friends, with our vegetarians, with, 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 with whoever's a, a little bit different than us, with your neighbors once again, and just start small. And I'll give you an example. I, 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 and I'm going to say it publicly, so now I have to do it. I want to sit down with, with 
with some council members from Ventura, maybe the mayor of Ventura. I'm going to shoot, shoot them some emails and say, I, I, I'd love to meet for, for tea at, at Palarmo's, which is a nice coffee shop on Main Street in Ventura. And um, I, I'd just like to talk to you about what are the current hiring practices in Ventura? My observations, the police department is, it doesn't have a lot of people of color. The fire department doesn't have a lot of people of color. And I'll just start there. If, if, I can, if, if, I can, if I can change fire departments, city, county, and state to start hiring more people of color, that, that, that would be just major. And then we'll, we'll, we'll worry about more men teachers. We need more men teachers in the lower grades. We need more teachers of color in the lower grades. That's where we can change this world. We teach the five-year-olds and six-year-olds that a person with brown skin is just the same as a person with white skin or black skin. That we all have the same interests. So that, that's, that's my hope, that we start taking some small steps. I, I, I have some Republican friends. I'm, I'm going to reach out to them here in the, in, in the next week or two. And uh, I'll probably go, na 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 na. You lost, but then I'll, I'll I'll apologize and tell them that I still love them and respect them. And they're still my friends. I'll close on that. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Morton to close us out. Good night, everybody. I have another meeting. <laughs> You're muted. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Very quickly, uh, Alan helped me to understand a mystery, Sarah. Um, it was Alan who put that curse on the Cleveland Indians. I always wondered where that came from. I'm going to follow up with him because I, uh, we lived just outside Cleveland for a number of years, and I have some stories to tell about uh, some of the efforts that went underway, were underway there. Um, I want to thank both Sarahs. <laughs> for the interpretation. Thank you so much for being a wonderful interpreter for us once more, Sarah. And thank you, Sarah, for your uh, service as a moderator. Uh, two board members, Kendra Paulding, I'm gonna recognize both of these folks, Kendra and Michael uh, Boyer, uh, were instrumental in making this happen tonight or helping to uh, put all of this together. And I really wanna thank them as well. So Alan has given us a lot to think about. Um, he's given us a lot of information and I'm going to um, chalk that up to uh, an opportunity for all of us to engage in our own personal, our own personal um, journey around educating ourselves on Native American and American Indian history and Chumash culture and history especially. And then lastly, um, just a reminder about our next program, which you can learn more about online over the next several weeks. Uh, January 6, we will have a program in, excuse me, in um, Paso Robos, which is related to the arts. And the themes include fostering diversity through the arts, promoting the arts in the park. Uh, this is, by the way, in association with the studio in the park up in Paso Robos. So again, um, this has been a wonderful, uh, evening, great conversation, great dialogue, uh, and Alan Salazar has helped us uh, to better understand a lot of what's going on around us and how and what ways we can be involved with the Chumash people and other people who are different. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Have a great night, and we will see you at the next program. Good night.